Hello, welcome to the Friday, June second, two thousand seventeen edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Quick warning from Xavier. Xavier discovered some webcast invite links, which apparently do include personal data about the user. The link was sent to as part of the URL. The idea here is that if you click on the link, then this information can be pre-filled into the form that you're using to sign up for the webcast. But if you are, for example, forwarding this link to a friend or even worse, post it on social media, you're also delivering your personal information, which may include things like phone number, email address, name and address. Of course, the problem that you're running into here is that you need to authenticate the user somehow before you are displaying personal information. Even if they would have just included a record locator in the URL, the data would still be pulled out of their database. And it may have actually been worse if they would have, for example, included a sequential ID instead of just the actual data. So, well, no good workaround around here, make your users either log in or make them fill in the form again. So the usual rule of thumb that I'm teaching when I'm teaching web application security is if you're never asked for a username and a password, something is probably wrong with the site. And cloud-based identity and access management company OneLogin apparently suffered a substantial breach that put all of their customer information at risk. This is, of course, particularly critical given the role that OneLogin plays in company's infrastructure. Essentially, what you're doing if you're signing up with OneLogin is that all of your identity management is done by OneLogin in the cloud. They also call it identity as a service. Now, the advantage of this, of course, is that you do not have to run your own identity management system, and that can be quite difficult, particular for smaller companies. With one login, an administrator has full control over what users can do either with internal systems or with third parties. A lot of cloud services, for example, can be controlled via one login. The problem, of course, on the other hand, is now since someone breached one login, whoever breached one login now has, according to one login, access to credentials that were used in order to log in to the site. And with that, of course, also access to whatever accounts were reachable via one login. A link in the show notes to the blog post by OneLogin. There's also a customer support article that, uh, as far as I can tell, is not publicly accessible. But essentially, it describes that customers have to reset their entire account setup. So it's not just changing usernames and passwords for users, but also changing SAML certificates, OAuth tokens, and Radius shared secrets, and all the other good stuff. So essentially, every Everything you're using to interface with one login needs to be reset. And according to a blog post by Citizens Lab, uh, recent phishing emails that are connected to some of the information leak and disinformation campaigns that are often associated with Russia used a pretty interesting trick in order to impersonate Google. Google offers AMP. AMP is a service that webmasters can use in order to accelerate their pages for mobile users. What you do is you essentially just prefix, for example, images with google.com slash AMP and then the domain name of your site and the URL of the image. But what happens here is that Google essentially acts as a proxy and the URL now looks like a legitimate Google URL. So Google com slash amp and then the domain name. Now, in the cases that Citizens Lab found, the actual domain then was tiny.cc, which is another URL shortener. So there were a couple of sort of redirects here involved until the victim ended up at the actual malicious site. But as far as the victim is concerned, they were still on google.com because all of this was passed through Google's AMP service. If you do run a corporate web proxy, you may want to take a look at 
who accessed Google AMP and how. Yes, it is used legitimately, so not everything going to Google AMP is bad, but probably worthwhile to take a look in particular at these tiny.cc links. Well, today I have with me Kevin Kelly, another one of our STI students, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about his research project involving Tesla Crypt. Uh, Kevin, uh, can you just introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Kevin Kelly. I am working now for a large financial institution. I have had three and a half decades of experience in cybersecurity and cyber investigations and programming, networking, and everything. I'm taking the STI master's degree program now basically to enhance and, and to keep up with the latest trends and, you know, that's going on in cybersecurity. Your latest trends, well, uh, your research paper was about something pretty hot these days, and that's a ransomware. Ransomware just doesn't seem to go away. Uh, you focused on a particular sample here, Tesla Crypt, and um, how to extract indicators of compromise. Can you talk a little bit about why Tesla Crypt and sort of what you found uh, were good and useful indicators of compromise there? So. We've had, we've had several compromises with ransomware. This particular variant, at the time of detection, one of the investigators in our office had found it, and it came through the help desk. Basically, the help desk had a call that somebody on the uh, other side couldn't get access to their files. You know, typical help desk call. They couldn't figure out what happened, so they called the cyber investigation with the incident response team. We found the uh, malware that was causing the encryption. We brought it back to our labs. We gave it to the SOC, and they gave it to McAfee. By the time that McAfee pushed it out to the endpoints, to the time that we have it, there's a little gap there. And what the indicators of compromise is, we use those indicators to close further gaps and to isolate and contain any other incidents on our network. So in this particular case, we were able to uh, get, get a sample of the malware, and then we ran it through our bare metal box type of environment. And we use a virtual system for that. Now, uh, you mentioned help desks. Uh, I find actually that help desks sometimes are pretty good indicators of compromise. Uh, in your particular organization, are you tying them into your SOC uh, incident response? Like, uh, how does that work? Uh, do they know what to listen for, essentially, uh, to, to, identify, to identify a problem like this? Oh, sure. Yeah. So from the, the time that this call was made to the time that we got it to the SOC and we got it to McAfee was about three hours. That includes the incident response, going and looking on the, you know, connecting to the user's workstation, seeing what was going on, grabbing the malware, and then, you know, getting it over there. So yeah, we do have a, a protocol that goes through with the help desk when they do certain things and if they can't figure it out, then it gets escalated to the next level. When it gets escalated to the next level, you know, we have our SOC team uh, gets involved. They take a look at it, and then if there's anything that needs to be further investigation, they'll, they'll kick it up and make it a security incident. Now, in the case of compromise, of course, that term is often uh mentioned with threat intelligence. Are you sharing uh, those indicators of compromise beyond your organization or is this mostly something you're using internally if you're doing an investigation like this? No, we have, there's, there's other, we, have, we go through FSISAC and there's a couple of other organizations that we go through. And like I said, we pass it over to McAfee. So McAfee analyzes it. Because we're a large organization and we give McAfee many, many copies of zero day exploits that they use to incorporate into their uh, data file, you know, we, we do get it out there kind of quick when we know it, that something's out there. We try to peer financial institutions. We, uh, we have liaisons between them also. Other people we've worked with, uh, we'll just pass it along and ask them questions to see if they have any other, um, not, not just in this case, but in all cases. If it's something unusual we see, we'll try to see if this, somebody else has any idea. And then we have our intelligence team and some other um, things that, that we can take a look at. Yeah, now, uh, having your own team internally to do this uh, kind of uh, analysis of malware uh, gives us a head start in you know, finding this indicators of compromise. Can you estimate like uh, how long it would have taken you to basically have anti-malware or so in place to detect this if you would not have had this internal capability? It's hard to guesstimate because there's ransomware out there and all they need to do is change the signature on it where the antivirus programs won't recognize it. And then it's pretty much we're waiting for whoever gets the first copy of it to send it to McAfee. McAfee puts in a thing into the data file and they push it out or whatever, semantic or whatever product that, that's being used. It's hard to say how long that's gonna, that, that generally takes place. But we try to, you know, when we find an, in, an indicator of compromise, we try to, you know, put a lot of resources into, you know, extracting it, getting the, 
the, the main compromises, and then getting other indicators of compromise that we can feed into our um, detection systems to, uh, to, to find other compromises on our system. Yeah, now, um, ransomware, of course, it hasn't stopped since Tesla Crypt. Tesla Crypt isn't necessarily the most recent uh, kind of ransomware there. Anything you're working on right now to sort of further develop uh, what you described in your paper? So basically, um, we get the malware and we, we, we'll treat it, you know, we'll, we'll run it through sandboxes and we'll get indicators and we'll pass them along. Uh, we'll try to close up the systems and then make sure that that's um, being taken care of. Thanks for uh, talking to us here. And again, uh, if anybody's interested in the research paper, you can find it in the cyber research section of uh, the sans.edu website. And uh, thanks, Kevin, here for making the time uh, to talk about your research. And that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.